This is our second time looking at Luke 6, 20 to 26. And what I'd like to do this time is ask about how we should understand what is being blessed and what is being cursed or upon which the woes are being pronounced. So let's read it, making note of what is being blessed and what is being cursed and then ask, now, what what are we to understand? Can we laugh or not laugh? Can we push away from a meal and feel full? And so on. Father, we, we want to be so careful and patient and hopeful and respectful of Jesus Christ and his word. Forbid that we would make light of his word or treat him as though he didn't know what he was doing or how he was talking. Guide us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you should be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now. For you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Now, what are we to make of this? Poor Hungry, weeping, and hated are pronounced blessed, 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 blessed. Is is everybody who's poor blessed of Jesus? Is everybody who happens to miss a meal or be in a position of starvation blessed? Is everybody who's weeping blessed? Is everybody who's hated blessed? If if that's the case, Christianity is over. Christ doesn't have anything to do with it. It's also it's all a sociological game. If you can get yourself poor or hungry or weeping or hated, then you have God's blessing. Why why don't we see it that way? And I have two suggestions. First, because it says disciples. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples, those who follow him, and said, Blessed are you, you disciples, if you happen to be poor. Blessed are you hungry now. If, if Blessed are you who, who happen to be hungry now, if you're my disciples. Blessed are you disciples who are weeping now. And the the blessing flows from the promises made. Yours is the kingdom, and you will be satisfied someday, and you shall laugh someday, and you can rejoice because your reward is great in heaven someday. And that's the ground of your rejoicing because you're my disciples, and don't let poverty or hunger or weeping or hatred stop you from rejoicing now because your reward is, reward is going to be great in heaven. That's my first argument for why we shouldn't simply say that that all the poor, all the hungry, all the weeping, all the hated are blessed without any reference to whether they are disciples or not. Here's a second observation. This blessing from being hated and excluded and reviled and spurned is because they are on account of the Son of Man. In other words, not everyone who is reviled 
or hated or excluded or spurned, but those who are hated on account of the Son of Man, which is just another way of saying disciples are devoted to the Son of Man. If what happens to them is owing to their life, lived for the Son of Man, if it comes on account of the Son of Man, then it is blessed. Not everyone who is hated is blessed. Not everyone who is excluded from a club is blessed or reviled is blessed. But those who live so devoted to the Son of Man and happen to be hated or excluded or reviled, they experience a blessing. So that's my second observation for why I think we are not to simply ascribe blessing to the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the hated. Because first, they are called disciples. Second, it all relates to whether they live for the Son of Man or not. Now, we have an even more difficult problem if we move to the second group and look at the rich, the full, the laughing, and those who are well spoken of. What are we to make of this? Is everyone who is rich under a woe? Is everyone who is has eaten a good meal and feels gratefully satisfied under a woe? Is everyone who laughs about um, a happy child or a funny joke or a surprising situation just laughs under a woe? Is everyone who happens to get an approval or some praise or a compliment under a woe? And of course, everything in us says, well, he just can't mean that, can he? <laughs> and he doesn't make any qualifications. He doesn't say rich and who rely upon their riches and full and, and boast in their fullness or laughing and, and use it as a way of putting others down or speak and spoken well of because you've uh, bribed people. There's no qualifications like that. He just says the rich, the fool, the laughing, and the well-spoken of are all under a woe. They're going to have things turned upside down on them, and punishments are going to come someday. Now, what are we to make of that? Are we just to say, well, it, it just can't mean that, <laughs> period. Let's just, let's just not let it mean what it says it means. Or do we look at the context long enough to see some clear indication that can't be what it means because of things in the context. That's what I want to do. Now, I know that I'm wired to say it just can't mean that because it seems to contradict a godly experience and other things in the Bible, but is there anything here? And, and let, me, let me show you what I've, I've seen. When... When Jesus says uh, to those who are hated and excluded and uh, reviled and spurned that they are blessed, he says, rejoice in that day. And he doesn't just say rejoice in that day. Now, not in the future. Like, it's going to come, it's going to be turned around someday. He says rejoice now. And he goes further than rejoicing to leap for joy. Now, surely leaping for joy Leaping for joy would have to include laughter. So now you've got Jesus commanding the very thing he pronounces a woe on. Right? You should respond to your being hated and excluded and reviled by rejoicing and leaping like a lamb from the stall. And you... It's just nonsense to say this leaping like a lamb from the stall doesn't include laughing. So what that means is we have a contextual pointer that this laughter here is not all laughter. This laughter, this leaping for joy, is not the kind of laughter that is woeful and is going to be punished with mourning and weeping. So that then gives us a clear indication. We can't just take riches and fullness and, and laughter and being well spoken of and say, well, any old riches, any old fullness, any old laughter, and any old being sp spoken well of 
is under the woe of Jesus. No, we've got a clear pointer that Jesus commands laughter. He commands leaping for joy. And therefore, this laughter must be of a certain kind. Now, what do we have a clue in the context of what's the difference between these two kinds of joy, happiness, laughter? And we do, right? We do. Because this one is owing to a situation in which we are living for the Son of Man. We have lived in a such a way that because we've devoted ourselves as to the Son of Man as our, our champion, our Lord, our Savior, our treasure, therefore we've gotten ourselves into a situation in which Jesus says, laugh. So this laughter then would be laughter that is not, not owing to living on account of the Son of Man. This laughter would be laughter that does not have its roots in a life devoted to the Son of Man. And that's the way I would then describe all of these. Riches that don't come from and get used for the Son of Man and devotion to Him are going to get you in trouble someday. Fullness right now that is not... Uh, flowing from your devotion to the Son of Man, and thanks are not arising to the Son of Man, and energy from this fullness is not devoted to living for the Son of Man, that's going to bring you down someday. And laughter that is not respectful of or honoring to the Son of Man is going to result in mourning and being well spoken of because you have avoided living for the Son of Man. So, I think Jesus has himself provided the clue for the fact that this, this laughter here cannot mean any old laughter, and this, therefore, this riches and fullness and being well spoken of cannot refer to any old riches and fullness and being well spoken of, but rather all of them are problems to the degree that they are not life devoted to the Son of Man. Now, here's my last question. Why, oh Jesus, why would you risk being misunderstood by not having any qualifications here for the rich, the full, the laughing, and the well-spoken of? I mean, that took a lot of work, didn't it? to spot the fact that there was an inconsistency here between rejoice and leap for joy and this laughter. That didn't come easy. It took me hours to see that once upon a time. And when I saw it, oh, I get it. There's a clue here. Now, why would Jesus do that? I don't know for sure, but let me make a suggestion. In Matthew 13, 10 to 13, it says, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak in parables? <laughs> he did not say, because it helps people understand. He said the opposite. He answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given and the one who has, and he will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear or understand. In other words, Jesus speaks in sometimes obscure, indirect language as a way of sifting out those who have been given to know and those who are blind and do not see. So in brief, I would say Jesus talks like this. He talks like this because he's testing us. Will we respect him? Will we revere him? Will we be patient? Will we love him?
Will we look and look and look and look at the book until we see what he intends us to see? Or is our heart disposed to criticize him quickly and reveal our failure of devotion? One more session on this. I want us to ask about the power of the promise of reward next time.